Good morning. Would you come in and sit down and join us? It does kind of feel like teaching when I ask you to be quiet. It's a pleasure to welcome you who are gathered here this morning, both those who are physically present and those who are joining us on Zoom. I'd like to invite anyone who has an announcement to come forward and share it with us at this time. There's a small group of us that we're talking about um, having a Sunday school class he meeting here, and we're going to we decide we're going to start this tongue-tied book um, two weeks from today. And uh, if you want to let me know if you're interested, then I could send you um, some information about it and their study guide questions. But um, and we we're thinking that probably the best place for us to meet is up the stairs in the fellowship hall across from the youth room, as far as availability of classrooms. So that's where we're going to plan to start two weeks. I think there's still one more book in the church office. Or um, anyway, starting two weeks from today. So it's time for Jana's annual review. Uh, PCRC, which is pastoral care relation committee, of which I should know since I'm the chair of that. So it's time for the annual review. There are copies of the review in the back that you can pick up. It includes kind of a brief description of, of, of Jana's job duties right now. Uh, those are due by next Tuesday, uh, a week from Tuesday. And you'll also get it uh, if you're on the email list. You'll get it there too. So go ahead and fill that out. And then from there, PCRC will review that. We'll review it with Jana and then with ZLT, so uh, pay attention to that. I expect to find about 70 or 80 reviews in my inbox, right? Okay, thanks. I'd like to share the following as our call to worship this morning. Come, Holy Spirit, enter our silences. Come, Holy Spirit, into the depths of our longing. Come, Holy Spirit, unmask our pretending. Enter our trusting. Enter our fearing. Enter our letting go. Enter our holding back. Come, Holy Spirit. Embrace and free us. Let's continue worshiping in song. Would you please join me in singing out of Voices Together, our purple hymnal, number 62. Voices Together, Number 62, God is here among us. Number 62.
verse 3 on the next page. Gladly we surrender earth's deceitful treasures, pride of life and sinful pleasures. God, we gladly offer thine to Beautiful, beautiful, even with a small group of you this morning. Thank you. Please take your blue hymnal and turn to 128. Blue hymnal, 128. And let's just go through this song by singing Lou so you can get familiar with it. It's pretty easy, but let's do Lou first. 128. Create in me a clean Would you play along with us, Kristen? Create in me a clean heart. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold We continue to give our offerings in the box at the table in the rear of the sanctuary or by mail to the church, but we also pray together. So let us pray for this offering. God of life, we give these offerings in gratitude, rejoicing in the abundance of your gifts to us. We give these offerings in faith, trusting that you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in the, this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves. May we live with generous hearts and open hands. Amen. The next item in the bulletin is passing the peace. And as I reflect on this, in this sobering time of a pandemic and the flu season and the cold virus, it's my belief that we should not put the Lord our God to the test. So I'm trusting that you have passed the peace as you entered this morning and that you will pass it again as you leave. But I'm not going to ask you to pass other things right now. Chris, will you and the children come forward for the story, please? The 
Good morning. Good morning again for those of you who are here for singing this morning. So I am Chris, and this, oh, I got it upside down, is my family. Now, you see it okay? This is the first time that my two grandchildren got to meet. It was about the 4th of July, and I love my family so much. This is me over here. I get to be the grandma. My husband, Toby, who's the grandpa. This is my son, Robert, and his little boy, Orville, and my daughter, Kendra, and her little girl, Anne. And I love my family so much. I pray every day, morning and night, and ask God to keep them healthy and safe. So you guys are all part of a family too, so you need to help me here. If you have a mom or a dad in your family, clap your hands two times. Excellent. If you got to stay in order here. If you have a brother or a sister in your family, put your hands on your head. All right. If you have an aunt or an uncle in your family, give yourself a hug. Yeah, we like that. If you have a grandpa or a grandma in your family, put your hands up. Yeah, grandpas and grandmas are a lot of fun. And if you have any cousins in your family, stand up. All right, everybody's got cousins. Now, I want you all to look out here. <laughs> well, it's not that bad. Your family loves you so much that I know a lot of people in your family pray to God every day and ask for you to be healthy and safe. Now, if you look out here at all these people, and if we could see inside that camera, we would see even more people at home worshiping with us. These people are our church family. You guys ever think about that? This is the Zion church family. Okay, you guys can sit down back there. And everyone here loves each other and prays every day for each other, especially the kids, that you will be healthy and safe. Okay, does anybody remember what this funny round picture of the earth is called? A globe. Oh, you guys are so smart. This is a globe of the earth. I call it a funny round picture because it's hard to make the earth flat. Everybody on this planet, all these colored places, is a child of God because God created the earth. God created everything and every person on it. And we are all children of God which makes us the family of God. Every person on the earth, we need to love them. That's what God wants us to do. And we need to remember to pray for every person on the earth every day that they are healthy and safe. Okay, so a prayer, everybody sit really still. I'm gonna say a short prayer and then we'll go back to our seats, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you for our families. We thank you for our individual families, our church family here at Zion, and we thank you for our worldwide family of God. Please help us to remember to pray every day and ask God to keep all of God's children healthy and safe. Amen. Good job. This morning, I'll read from the New Testament and from the Hebrew Bible. When Steve emailed me the two sermon parts, I felt that they were tailor-made for me, and I hope you will find them tailor-made for you as well. One part, us versus them mentality, seems especially appropriate in so many ways for the times in which we leave, live. Uh, a little bit of context, Cornelius is going to Joppa to meet with Peter. Acts 10, 9 to 16. The next day, as the three travelers were approaching the town, Peter went out on the balcony to pray. It was about noon. Peter got hungry and started thinking about lunch. 
while lunch was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the skies open up, something that looked like a huge blanket lowered by ropes at its four corners settled on the ground. Every kind of animal and reptile and bird he could think, think of was on it. Then a voice came, go to it, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, oh no, Lord, I've never so much as tasted food that was not kosher. The voice came a second time. If God says it's okay, it's okay. This happened three times, and then the blanket was pulled back up into the skies. For the second part of the sermon, the community-based language and the role of family and community prayer is one that I and many of you felt have felt recently. Many of us here and on Zoom have battled cancer or other illnesses and experienced the love of family and the heartfelt prayers of our beloved community. A little context here, the people of Israel had just crossed the Jordan and were about to go to Jericho. There's a lot of violence on both sides of this, and it's hard, it's hard stuff, but it has to do with uh, family and community-based language. Joshua 4, 1 through 9. When the whole nation was finally across the Jordan, God spoke to Joshua. Select 12 men from the people a man from each tribe, and tell them, from right here, the middle of the Jordan, where the feet of the priests are standing firm, take 12 stones. Carry them across with you and set them down in the place where you camp tonight. Joshua called out the 12 men from who, whom he selected from the people of Israel, one man from each tribe. Joshua directed them, Cross to the middle of the Jordan and take your place in front of the chest of God, your God. Each of you heft a stone to your shoulder, a stone for each of the tribes of the people of Israel, so you'll have something later to mark the occasion. When your children ask you, what are these stones to you? You'll say, the flow of the Jordan was stopped in front of the chest of the covenant of God as it crossed the Jordan, stopped in its tracks. These stones are a permanent memorial for the people of Israel. The people of Israel did exactly as Joshua commanded. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, a stone for each of the 12 tribes, just as God had instructed Joshua, carried them across with them to the camp and set them down there Joshua set up the 12 stones taken from the middle of the Jordan that had marked the place where the priests who carried the chest of the covenant had stood. They are still there today. Steve. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I understand it's been a couple years since you've led, and I've appreciated you jumping back in and your thoughtfulness this morning. Um, and thanks to all of you for letting me lead some music last week. Um, and thanks for sticking with me, learning a song or two yourselves. Uh, it was good to have Jana share last week from Colossians. Well, there were some great reminders about how we practice forgiveness, how we can care for one another. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, on the back of the bulletin, there's a small section titled With Praise and Gratitude. Uh, it sort of came out of last week in response. Each week, there'll be something new listed there since there's so many things that we can be grateful for. Um, and thanks for jumping in last minute this morning, Jana, and covering. <laughs> uh, 
Speaking of being grateful and being thankful, uh, thanks for the ways that you've expressed appreciation to the pastors here at Zion. I've got some of the cards from youth and younger kids on my door. You're welcome to check it out as you walk by. Um, yeah, it's great to see that. feels sort of like I have a refrigerator, but not quite a refrigerator. Um, it's been good to be here as well for the past now four and a half months. Uh, I've particularly appreciated uh, working with Jana and Jody. There's so many things, projects that they both take on behind the scenes that keep the church functioning. And if you aren't aware, the behind the scenes stuff the behind the scenes work usually goes something like this. No one notices what you're doing at all until there's a mistake. And then you get to hear about it. So, Jody, if you're watching online, Gianna, thanks for all you do around here. Definitely grateful for both of you and we appreciate your work. So, let's jump in. The Lord be with you. This is week three in our series inspired by tongue-tied book, uh, learning the lost art of talking about our faith, uh, which uh, Stan's announcement earlier about a Sunday school class coming up in a couple of weeks. If you want a book for that and don't make the mad dash to get the last one that's in the office, uh, let me know or let Stan know, uh, somehow contact us. We can order more and usually, uh, I think if we get Ten at a time, we get them at a discounted rate. Uh, so let us know, and we'd be happy to, to do that. But the author of the book, Sarah wenger uh, this Tuesday, she'll be hosting a Zoom conversation about the book uh, at 4 p.m. Pacific time. If you want, you can register to be part of that Zoom conversation by going to menomedia.org slash common read, if that's too much to remember. Uh, come see me. I'll try and get you an email or a text and get the information to you. Again, that's menomedia.org slash common read. And it's this coming Tuesday. Um, I've also appreciated hearing from some of you already about how you're connecting with parts of the book. Um, so far, we've talked about how the insider language we sometimes use becomes a challenge to talking about our faith, about the challenges created by how we think about faith and certainty, how we balance those two. Today, I'm going to be covering two more topics related to how we've lost our fluency and why we generally can get tongue-tied and find it difficult to talk about our faith. So these first three Sundays, they aren't necessarily the most empowering or inspiring, but they're necessary. We've got to spend time talking about the reasons behind why we might get tongue-tied so we can develop new skills, so we know where to go from here, so we can identify what the problems are and how to do better. I tend to think about it like this. The rule that's hardest to change is the rule that remains the most hidden. It's true for families and certainly for church families like ours and broader church families, that's also true when it comes to talking about our faith. So these first few weeks, we're naming some of the challenges, some of the issues behind why it's difficult to talk about our faith. And then, hopefully, it will be much easier to be honest about those issues when we can name them. We're laying the foundation for developing new tools, tools to do better. Next Sunday, we're going to start with that part. We're going to start in with the learning fluency part. So in chapters 5 and 6, six Schenck identifies two reasons why we have lost our fluency, why we find it difficult to talk about our faith in meaningful ways. The first, as Tom has mentioned, is the us versus them mentality. The second is our vanishing community-based language. Um, sometimes, as I was reading, it was kind of hard to contrast those two. On one hand, we're encouraged to not have an us versus them mentality, and yet at the same time, cultivate a community-based language that in a way 
sets us apart. And I think those two get held in tension. So let's jump in with a passage from the book of Acts and how an us versus them attitude is challenged. So I'd never say or do anything to create an us versus them mentality intentionally, but I think it's something that in churches and congregations we do subtly. It's revealed in small things that we do. This could be us versus all the non-believers out there, and it could be an our brand of Christianity is better than their brand of Christianity. There's so many examples of how this can creep in, but let me just give you one, and it fits this time of year pretty well. It's happened in multiple churches that I've been part of and on staff at. So as is usually the case in churches that are surrounded or in the midst of neighborhoods or close to neighborhoods, this particular church and this staff meeting, we were figuring out what to do for Halloween. Whether our Halloween, I mean, fall harvest festival, whether it would be on a Wednesday, which was the usual kids and youth and choir meeting night, or it would really be on October 31st, the night when everyone in our community in the neighborhood was out. We decided on October 31st for the carnival, so we planned the event, and we started circulating all the flyers, and we posted signs to promote the event, and it was, of course, on the church webpage and out in front of the church on a big banner, and it said, October 31st, 5 to 8 p.m., Fall Carnival, a safe alternative for our kids and families. And there it was, the us versus them mindset. And we didn't realize it because it was in the subtext. By promoting the event as a safe alternative for kids and families, we were telling people that their own neighborhoods weren't safe. We were telling parents that walking around their neighborhood with their kids was dangerous and that their neighbors were dangerous. But our carnival, it was safe. And if they wanted to be responsible parents, they should skip the danger of their neighborhood and come to our church instead. In Acts chapter 10, Peter's us versus them mentality is hit square in the face by God's consistent desire to restore all people of the world, not just those like Peter. Peter was Hebrew. He was a descendant of Abraham and Sarah, and we'll get to that part in just a bit. But he was a descendant of Abraham and Sarah just many, many generations later and, later. and Peter, like many others, thought that to have a restored relationship with God, he had to follow all the Hebrew customs and become a Hebrew culturally. Really, how do I get all this from a vision Peter had about expanding his food palate? But it goes like this. For Peter and the Hebrew people, there were very specific rules about what they could and could not eat and still be able to worship God in the temple. If they ate something they weren't supposed to or came in contact with someone or something, they would have to go through a cleansing period, a quarantine period maybe. And these rules were intended to help people identify them as a people and remember a reminder, sorry, of their covenant with God but somewhere along the way, Peter and much of the Hebrew people started to believe that their relationship with God was exclusively meant for them. No one else could have that same relationship unless they became Hebrew and followed all the same Hebrew customs concerning food. So this dream, vision, trance, I think he was just kind of had that hangry feeling and was taking a nap and he started to smell the food and afternoon, so it's nap time. See, Peter, Peter had this and God was reminding Peter of the bigger picture. See, in the kingdom of God, there's no such thing as those people. Peter had forgotten what it says in our other passage at the end in Joshua 10, where God says, so that all the earth's people might know. Peter mistook responsibility for privilege, 
And even though he received this amazing message from God telling him otherwise, other stories in the book of Acts tell us Peter would continue to struggle with treating non-Hebrew believers as second class. He and Paul would have multiple confrontations on the issue. So even with someone as close to Jesus as Peter was, the us versus them mentality is real. I'm sure you don't have to let your memory go too far to recall a time when you might have gotten the message that being Mennonite meant you were more right than others, more Christian than others, or more faithful than others. So coming from other branches of the Christian faith, let me reassure you, this us versus them mentality and superiority complex is not just reserved for Mennonites. We've all got it, and there's all kinds of ways that we subtly communicate this to each other. So there's beauty in belonging to a people with a strong community identity that makes sense, especially when it comes to a community of faith identity. But there's a shadow side to that that we sometimes slip into. The, the shadow side of the problem is when those strong shared ties mutate, shift into exclusion and conformity. And our desire to make our community strong, we often define it over and against all others. We fall into the trap of exclusivity and conformity to solidify our numbers in hopes of holding on to the power and influence we mistakenly think belong to us and not God. Any chosenness we might feel must always remain open. Schenck makes this point by writing, Jesus was not condemned by atheists or agnostics, but by religious leaders who whipped their followers into a frenzy, goading them to believe their tribe's faith was under siege. They used fear. Jesus had his most significant conflicts with the religious rulers, the religious authorities, the leaders, a.k.a. church folks. Jesus' continued challenges threatened the misplaced authority of the church, and this is ultimately what got him killed. They had had enough and couldn't take his challenges any longer. And just like in Jesus' day, the us versus them mentality is being used today to draw all kinds of lines, to create all kinds of groups motivated by fear instead of love. This is one reason why, and I think a very important reason why, recovering our language of faith is so important. There are times when I hear the Christian faith being combined with a nationalist or racist agenda. Regaining our ability to talk about faith means that when those racist voices motivated by power and fear speak, we can say in response, not in my name and not in the name of Christianity. In addition to the us versus them mentality, Shank identifies a vanishing ability to pass on a language of faith. One place in scripture where this issue is brought up is in Joshua 4. Now, we're jumping in partway through the story, and it's a big story. So let me summarize and get us caught up with what's happening. I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning, like the beginning beginning, but I think it matters, and I think I can do this sort of quickly, so stick with me. God made all we know, including us, humanity. God set humanity apart from all other things because God wanted a relationship with us. In order for that relationship to be mutual, God gave us free will. That free will allows us to choose apart from God. We have the choice to not have a truthful and honest relationship with God, which is exactly what we chose. Sin enters the equation, and sin is the brokenness when we choose apart from God. 
So we are left dealing with the consequences of choosing apart from God, and those consequences are vast. They're all-encompassing. In fact, all creation has been negatively impacted. But God loves us too much to leave us there. God wants to restore the relationship we have broken, and God wants to show all humanity that God can and should be trusted. So God decides to start building that trust with a small group of people that can then show all the people of the world the wholeness that comes from a trusting relationship with God. God starts with Abraham and Sarah. God reaches out to them, he develops a covenant with Abraham and Sarah, and that covenant will include all of their descendants, which they didn't have any of yet, but that's a detail for another time. Abraham and Sarah eventually have a lot of children. And generations later, those children move to Egypt because of a famine. The Egyptians get scared that they're all going to take over, and so they decide to make all of Abraham and Sarah's descendants slaves. God, still wanting to show his love to all people, uses a man named Moses to rescue the descendants of Abraham and Sarah from slavery. Those descendants are now called the Israelites or the Hebrew people or the 12 tribes. All of those words are pretty much exchangeable. They're called the 12 tribes because, well, there were different, 12 different tribes of the Hebrew people. The 12 tribes are led out of Egypt by God. They cross the Red Sea on dry land because God does a miracle. And they're promised to eventually get some prime real estate, which will generate all kinds of wealth for them. That prime real estate, though, it's also at a crossroads of major trade routes in the area, which is why it was prime real estate and why it would generate lots of wealth for them. And all the trade that happens there will also provide a way for the story of God to eventually spread to all other people in the world. Because as people travel these trade routes, they're interacting with the 12 tribes, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, and word spreads. So the Hebrew people have been wandering for generations, and they come and they can see the prime real estate and all of its wealth and all of its trade routes just on the other side of a large river called the Jordan River. That's where our passage from the book of Joshua starts off. It's called the book of Joshua because Joshua is the one who took over leading the Hebrew people once Moses died. So, if you're new to faith or the Bible and didn't grow up hearing Bible stories, hopefully that has filled in a couple gaps. If you've still got some questions, that's fine. Stick around. Don't be afraid to ask some questions. Some of this will eventually start to sound familiar, but here in this passage from Joshua, we have the 12 tribes on one side of the Jordan River and the prime real estate God promised to them on the other side of the Jordan. And to get the 12 tribes across the river, God does a miracle. God parts the water so they can cross safely. God moves the water out of the way and they all cross on dry land. While they're doing that, God tells Joshua to then tell all of them to pick up some stones from the middle of the river, which is not currently a river because, well, it's dry land and it will eventually be a river soon. Joshua sets those stones up in a place called Gilgal. It's the place where they set up camp that night after crossing the river. What's interesting to me isn't how many stones or where the stones were from or what shape they were in, but why God wanted them to create a big pile of stones. In verse 20, we find out why. So this is Joshua 4:20. Beginning in 20, Joshua set up at Gilgal those 12 stones they had taken from the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, your children will ask their parents, what about these stones? 
Then you will let your children know Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. This was because the Lord your God dried up the water of the Jordan before you until you crossed over. This was exactly what the Lord your God did at the Red Sea. He dried it up before us until we crossed over. This happened so that all the earth's peoples might know that the Lord's power is great and that you can always revere or trust the Lord your God. See, in the future, your children will ask their parents, what about these stones? So you let your children know Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. This happened so that all the earth's people, that was always the focus and goal, all the earth's people might know that the Lord's power is great and that you can trust in the Lord. The stones were there so that they would have another opportunity to tell their children about how trustworthy God is, to develop a language, to tell the stories. And that was so that all humanity might come to know how trustworthy God is as well. They were doing things to tell this story. They were finding ways to talk about God and their experiences. And they did that within the context of a community. So like the author of our book, I sometimes hear people start conversations with, I'm no the theologian, but, and then what usually follows is a wonderfully thoughtful question or response having to do with where God is in the midst of life's experiences. See, we're all theologians because we're all capable of talking about our desire to know God and we're capable of talking about events where we sensed God's presence. This passage in Joshua is telling us that anyone looking at a pile of rocks could, can take time to teach each other, to teach our children. Despite our own worries and, and agendas, despite our own insecurities, we can take time to pay attention and watch for what God is doing in our lives to watch for what God is doing in our world, to enter in and pray together. And then we engage in conversation about those things, about what God is doing in and for our world, about the faithfulness of God, about how we hope the faithfulness of God will show up in the future. And as we do those things, it shapes our language as a community. Regaining a sense of community faith language is simply a matter of speaking it together, a matter of praying together regularly and not thinking theology is something that is saved for the professionals. By how we talk to each other, by how we pray together for one another and with one another, by how we tell stories of faith to each other, especially our younger generations, our language of faith will develop and be passed on, much like the stories that the Israelites would tell when their, Christian, when their children would ask questions about why there's a big pile of rocks still in Gilgal next to the Jordan River. So this morning, we looked at two issues that have caused us to lose our fluency. There's this us versus them mentality and our vanishing community-based language, and the way that we learn and pass on that language. Previous weeks, we looked at being disillusioned with our inherited faith, the, the trouble with superficial Christianese language. Again, there's that language thing popping up. And we looked at the tension of faith and certainty, how we can talk about the truth and trust God in the midst of that? And really, how do we depend on truth? So with Shank's help, we have identified a bit about how we got here, which, while not the most exciting or potentially hopeful, I think it's helpful. It's helpful because we now get to work out where do we go from here 
how do we regain our fluency and talk about our faith in meaningful ways? Next week, we'll jump in there. Having identified some of the issues, let's start reconstructing. Next week, we start on how we can discover freedom, honesty, and resolve when talking about our faith, looking at scripture that lays the foundation for this freedom, honesty, and resolve, how we can develop fluency in talking about our faith. I'm looking forward to joining you there, joining you here in this place, in person and online, and continuing this journey with all of you. I'm also looking forward to hearing more from you about what connects with you, about uh, maybe what challenges you in the book, uh, and that'll help us make this journey together. Let's pray. Lord, thanks that we can belong to a community of faith. Thanks that uh, there are things that we can pass on as we tell the story, as we construct concrete reminders of your faithfulness as we pray with and for one another. Forgive us for the times that in the midst of uh, our community identity, we start to think that uh, that gives us a claim on you, on exclusivity. Help us to remember uh, that just like Peter, you have always had a vision for all people of the world coming to know your wholeness. Forgive us for the times that we stand in the way of that, and may your spirit continue to guide us as we move forward to talk well, truthfully, faithfully about our faith, about who you are, and may we tell your story well. Amen. As we pray together this morning, I want to just bring your attention in the tongue-tied book to pages 104, 105 that talk about prayer. Um, I encourage you to read there. It's uh, just bringing attention to a lot of us are quite embarrassed if we're asked to pray in a group um, or to lead a prayer. And to me, it comes, what helps is just to be around people that pray and to hear those prayers and you kind of learn that. So I want to remind the congregation that there is a group that prays every Wednesday intentionally for you, for our congregation, for those in our community. And it's not a closed group. This is an open group that you can join at any time. Um, I shared my some of my story last week where I was so depressed and overwhelmed in the hospital that I needed some other people praying for me because I couldn't do that myself. So read that two pages about the importance of prayer. And as we go to prayer this morning, I want to leave some open spaces for spontaneous words, um, phrases that can come from you. So I'm going to try to hear those up front that I can repeat them to those that are on Zoom. Um, hopefully I can hear you and you don't feel like you're yelling, but we have missed our prayer and share time. I know people have said to me, Jana, that's what I miss in our service when we pass the mic and we can hear from one another of our praises and our prayer concerns. So there'll be some moments of silence and then I will invite you to um, spontaneously say your words through our time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord, you have searched us and you know us quite well. You know when we sit and when we rise. You perceive our thoughts from far off. You discern our going out and our lying down. 
and you are familiar with all our ways. Before a word is on our tongue, Lord, you know it completely. This morning, as your body gathered, we give praise and thanksgiving, God, for what you have done. We share specific acts of your faithfulness to us. God, thank you for a healthy grandson that was born this past week. Your faithfulness in transition God, we come before you to intercede for our local concerns and our worldwide concerns. We pray for this community and those in leadership. God, be with our communities surrounding this church. We think of 91 School. We think of other schools, North Marion, Canby. Lord, that you would just be with our students and teachers, those in administrative roles. Continue to give them wisdom and discernment as they care for the health and well-being of all. And God, we lift to you our particular needs today for ourselves and for others. For Caitlin, For Julie, for Doug Berkey, for Clyde Hockman. Healing for Libby and the cast that she carries. God, we think of those who cannot worship with us this morning because of challenging illness or recovery. We ask for your comfort and your hope to surround them, that they would know your loving arms are there protecting and providing. God, we pray for the church universal, for the unity of the church around the world and this church community.
May we, your followers, serve each other with compassion, understanding, sympathy, and love when we go through difficult times. Thank you, God, that you give us each other at those times when we're too afraid or fe fearful to come to you ourselves. And we pray together the prayer that you taught us as we lift all of these cares to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please take your voices together hymnal and turn to 719. 719. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able to sing. Seven hundred nineteen. Jesus, help us live in peace. From our blindness, set us free. Fill us with your healing love. Help us live. times we don't agree or what's right or wrong to do it's so hard to really see one again a cappella. Jesus help us live in peace. From our blindness set us free. Fill us with your healing love. Help us live Remain standing for the benediction. I'll share this from Voices Together. Go, knowing you are beloved by God. Go, praising God for the good news in Jesus Christ. Go, living the message of God's grace, peace, and love. Amen. And now you can greet each other.